Hi, welcome to Ethics in Research Publication. I'm Peter Marbet. I'm a QCE, which is a quality control editor here at American Journal of Experts, which is a division of Research Square. And I'll be assisting. authorship and ghost authorship, and ethics in author services. In between each topic, I'll take a few moments to go from, uh, from slide to slide and open it up to questions from y'all. So that's when I'll get to your questions. If you type in a question beforehand, I'll try to get back to it. I can't promise that I'll be able to scroll, but I'll do my best. So as you can see, plagiarism is defined by the U.S. Office of Research Integrity as the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. So, simply put, it's a misrepresentation of someone else's original thought as your own. Now, the three types I'm going to go over in detail are verbatim plagiarism. That's the most obvious form and the easiest to catch. Then, a little bit more tricky is the plagiarism of ideas, and finally, loose paraphrasing. So verbatim plagiarism is just that. It's word for word copying from someone else's work. And if somebody has taken words from one source and another source and yet another source and put them into his or her own work, we call that mosaic or patchwork plagiarism. And these examples are kind of small. I do forgive the size of the font, but you'll see that the original text and the verbatim plagiarism are identical. Nothing has changed. It's word for word the same. That is not going to get past a uh, journal editor and shouldn't get past uh, reviewers either. So all you have to do to alleviate that problem is enclose those words with quotation marks. So there is an opening quotation mark at the beginning, and a closing quotation mark at the end. And usually you preface the words that you've taken from someone else with a signal phrase, such as, other researchers found that, or Wu notes that, or others found. And at the end of the quotation, you include a citation. And these will vary according to the publisher's guidelines. So here I have a parenthetical citation that begins with the author's names and the uh, year of publication, which is one of the most common. But you'll also see a superscripted number, which is considered an annotation, and there are various other forms of citations too. Plagiarism, plagiarism of ideas is a little trickier. Um, this is when you mention someone else's idea. So this could be their theory, their interpretation, their data, their method, their opinion, or some new terminology they came up with without citing the source. So even if you use your own words, it's still considered plagiarism. So here I have the same text, and in the plagiarized idea example, you'll see that the words are completely different. The wording's not the same. I've added a few things, I've moved things around, but the idea is the same. So all I have to do to make it proper, to cite it uh, correctly, is to include a parenthetical citation at the end, or if the publisher wants an annotation. So no quotation marks are needed because I'm not using a word-for-word -word representation. I'm just capturing the idea. But I definitely have to give credit to whoever came up with that. Otherwise, my reader is going to assume that I'm talking about my results and not those of someone else. With loose paraphrasing, you can take someone else's work and change it slightly, effectively maintaining the author's logic while mentioning most of the same ideas. But if you maintain the same flow of an argument, that's considered an original idea. So that should be cited as well. And in this example, you'll see that the original text is one sentence mentioning the two bacteria and that they're easily transferred from these chicken products to consumers. In the loose paraphrase, 
I've gone and divided this information among two sentences, added some content, expanded it a little bit, but I still have the same idea. So I should have a citation after both of these sentences to indicate that it's coming from Lou. Now the types of sources that are often uh, noted for plagiarism are other journal articles or books. Uh, editors have no problem citing these issues. Peer reviewers have no problem citing these issues. And plagiarism is definitely a, um, a red flag to publication. It's going to interfere with someone being able to get their work out there for a larger audience. But it's also easy to forget about alternative sources, such as lectures, blogs, or personal communication. So if a colleague of yours has emailed you to try to change up the technique somehow, to approach your methodology from a different angle, maybe include a different assay, or uh, change the temperature, something as minor as that, you can cite it, and you should cite it, because that indicates that they have contributed to their, your study. And that also shows that you're, uh, you're collaborating with others, that your work is not just limited to a small group of five in some lab somewhere, that it's part of a larger project. So it makes your paper look as though it has a, uh, a broad reach. So do be careful to cite alternative sources as well. And if you're wondering, how do I cite uh, something that somebody emailed or tweeted me, now that we can tweet over 140 characters, um, it's possible. There are plenty of guidelines out there. I know the Chicago guidelines, but each publisher has his or her own uh, style sheet for their journal. So make sure to give your colleagues the credit they, they deserve. And when you send them information that helps with their study, make sure they cite you as well. Now, the other tricky topic is self-plagiarism. Some people don't think this is a thing. Uh, <laughs> however, it is. This is when you actually refer back to earlier work that you did. And the problem when, with this is if you don't cite that earlier work, your reader is going to assume that what you're writing about is brand new. They don't know that you did this research six months ago, two years ago, or ten years ago. So even though this doesn't cross the line of stealing from others, it does create problems in the publishing world. So I'm going to talk about some of those problems here. When your manuscript contains unsighted recycled information, you're countering the unspoken assumption that you're presenting entirely new discoveries. So the reader assumes that everything you're writing about is new. It's this new experiment, this new model. But if you've included something from an earlier study, your reader may not necessarily know that you're referring to your earlier work. Do cite your earlier work. Selfishly, you should do this so that your readers are directed to your earlier work so that they will go read it and then perhaps cite it in their own work, which builds how many citations you're getting out there in the field. So definitely cite yourself. Um, give yourself credit as well. Another problem is that the publication that you uh, had done 2, 10, 20 years earlier is probably the property of the journal. Unless you submitted to an open access journal and you have a uh, commons agreement, then that journal actually owns the copyright. Now, you own the intellectual property. It is yours, but you need to cite that in order to comply with uh, the journal. And again, I always appeal to selfishness here. <laughs> you want people to be able to know that you did some work in this field and you produced results before you started this new experiment. So direct them to your earlier work uh, so that they'll be able to enjoy it as well. And lastly, duplicate plagiarism. Now this is a form of self-plagiarism where somebody will take a paper, submit it to one publisher, have it published, and then go to another publisher. Not a good idea. Um, it's uh, going to run into some problems with the publishers. 
most likely your original article won't be retracted. However, you probably will have a great deal of difficulty submitting any other work to that publisher again. And word gets around in the publishing industry of people who perform du duplicate plagiarism. So do be careful. If your work was published elsewhere, especially if it were published in a print journal, don't try to publish it in another um, publisher's journal. Now most journals will have a disclosure statement that you have to sign that indicates that you have not submitted this work for publication elsewhere and nothing in the work has been published elsewhere. So by agreeing to that, you're saying I'm not committing duplicate plagiarism. All right. Now that's my last slide on uh, plagiarism and I see some uh, agreement from everyone in the chat box. Uh, now's a good time if you have any questions about plagiarism to raise those or if you have any feedback, if you'd like for me to slow down, if you'd like more examples as I'm speaking, I'd like to know. And the awkward pause is because I'm watching as people type. <laughs> yeah, so I will keep going. I'm just waiting for a few questions to come in. And we won't take too long with the question and answer session. Um, Pete, I, I wanted to ask uh, a question real quick and just to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Teresa. I also work here at AJE. Um, and I was curious, um, just with your uh, knowledge of the industry, do you um, do you know which one of these might be the easiest for authors to, you know, to accidentally do or to fall into um, without realizing it? Is there one that seems yeah. to be more common or, or more easy to um, to commit? Yeah, I, I, two good questions there, Teresa. Um, I think the one that's easily to commit is self plagiarism because you're referring to something you already know well, and you may just forget to cite yourself. Um, mm -hmm. That's very easy to do, and because you're not crossing any ethical um, boundaries of taking from someone else, some people don't even consider it plagiarism. Sure. But publishers do. <laughs> sure, that makes sense. Um, as for what's most common, I honestly don't know. Uh, having taught um, at the university for uh, quite a few years, I know what's common in the classroom, and that's verbatim plagiarism, um, but in the publishing industry, it depends. It depends on uh, the writer. If the writer's coming from a culture in which collaboration's promoted, mm -hmm. and collaboration's promoted to the extent that citation isn't a social norm, mm -hmm. then you're probably going to see a good deal of verbatim plagiarism coming from people in that culture. Yeah. Um, but I'm speaking anecdotally. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any evidence in front of me. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Thank you. And yes, Frederico, the session is being recorded. And do we have a link to share at the end, Teresa? Yes. So after, um, so great question. And after um, this webinar is over, we will email everyone a link with um, a link to the recording, as well as we can send out the uh, PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, because I was going to say, I think we received that question at the beginning um, for for that specific. Um, to be sent out. So yes, we are recording it. Excellent. Um, and Sally, do you paraphrase your own previous work when citing it in a new work? You may paraphrase it, you may directly quote it. Generally, I think that most people paraphrase their earlier work because they're so familiar with it and they're just going to rephrase um, what they had written before. However, you can go ahead and directly quote yourself if, if you wish. And Patrick, yeah, lead phrases and signal phrases. Uh, it depends on the structure of the sentence. Sometimes a, a quotation can stand alone. Traditionally, though, there's at least a two-word phrase such as author notes or author states uh, preceding the um, quotation just because it reads better with the sentence flow. 
However, I can think of examples where you would just start off with the direct quotations. And multiple attendees are typing. We'll get to multiple uh, questions here in a moment. Um, I, do, I do have one more question, sure. if that's okay. Um, are there things that seem... Um, that seem like you would have to to cite that you actually that you actually don't like. Are there examples of um, you know any time that you you don't actually have to cite something but may not be as obvious to to people, or is it or is it better to kind of err on the side of caution and and cite something and then the journal would let you know if you no know, you actually don't have to include that. Yeah, err on the side of caution. Um, okay. <laughs> I once had a, a professor just tell us in grad school that we should cite everything but the introductory sentence because nothing that we could come up with possibly be original. Now that doesn't apply to the sciences so well because you are presenting your own work obviously. Um, but if you think that well this sounds a lot like what's coming from um, Wang and Fu then by all means cite Wang and Fu. Uh, mm -hmm. If you feel like it's um, a novel term that another scholar coined so it's a, a certain phrase that's not often used in the literature, or it's a, a brand new word that hasn't been used in the literature aside from this one uh, person's work. Yeah, definitely cite it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a great question, Lasu. Um, Well, Sue, I think that all you would need to do is cite the publication uh, or footnote it. You wouldn't need to put it in quotation marks, I don't think. Uh, that's something I would ask your dissertation director just to be certain. It's an excellent question. Oh, Vinay. Um, if you're a freelancer who is working directly with the client, please do tell the author that you noticed that this piece had been published before and that it may not be able to be published in another journal. Um, I wouldn't put many, any more work into that manuscript uh, until you hear back from the author. If you're a contractor working for an author service, then I would contact them immediately and ask what their policy is. Is part of the results for only study published previously? Yes, Santosh. Uh, by all means, include the results from your uh, previously published study. Unless you replicated the experiment, uh, I would go ahead and cite where those results come from. So your reader knows that this comes from that earlier study. Again, that way the reader is directed to your study and can uh, use that study in his or her own work. Which, you know, the more citations you get, the better. It's, it's like likes. Mm -hmm. And sorry for the vague social media reference. You're welcome. We use pronouns. And I saw some more typing, but I do want to move on to the next topic soon. Um, we can always return to plagiarism at the end. There will be plenty of time uh, to wrap up as well. All right, thank you for your questions. Yeah, I'd like to move on to the next topic. And thank you, Teresa, for, for joining in. No, thank you, Pete. This is great. All right, predatory open access journals. Uh, this is the scary part. Open access journals provide many benefits for authors and readers. And many, if not most, operate for the right reasons. They want to get your work out there for a larger audience in a way that's easily accessible. It's, it's free access. Um, they want to uh, cut through a lot of the weight that you see with uh, print journalism. And they also want to cut through the problem of not everybody being able to access print journals because not everybody can get to a university library or other institution that can pay for them. So there are some out there, though, that realize that 
Authors are trying to get their work published and they'll take advantage of those authors. They'll actually just take your money and not necessarily advance your scholarship. So the cost of predatory journals. Well, number one, they take your money. <laughs> they take away your ability to uh, publish elsewhere. So if you sign an agreement with one of these predatory journals, and in the agreement you cede the copyright to them, then you can't publish your work anywhere else without their permission because they're doing this for profit. They're not doing it to get your work out there. And of course this can misinform readers and undermine public trust because although your work is sound scientifically, the work in the rest of the journal may not be. So your work may be grouped with works by uh, others who are um, generating content that is not scientific, scientifically true. Nine things to watch out for. And actually we have an online article on our Author Resource Center and I'll give you a direct link to that at the end of this talk. I'm borrowing heavily from that. So Dr. Prater, uh, I thank her very much for the eight warning signs that she gave. I just happened to add one. <laughs> so first of all, if the journal asks for a submission fee or a handling fee instead of a publication fee, basically a submission fee is charged before your paper is published and a publication fee is charged after. Now not every journal that uh, charges a submission fee is predatory, but if a journal charges one, please look it up. Uh, search it online to see what others have to say about it and find out whether it's reputable. The copyright. An open access journal retains the copyright rather than issuing a Creative Commons license. So a Creative Commons license is the license that allows for the free distribution of your work. Libraries don't have to pay for it. Other, researcher, other researchers and institutions don't have to pay for it. They can access it wherever they can link to the web. So if there's no Creative uh, Commons license, that journal may be retaining the copyright and not permitting you to distribute this uh, material elsewhere. So do be careful. This may be a little more obvious, the Board of Editors. If the journal's Board of Editors is full of people you don't recognize in your field, that's not a good sign. Do search their names and you may find out that they are actually well-established uh, scientists or researchers in their fields. It's just that they happen to be uh, in a region where their work hasn't been heavily promoted. So take that into account. But more than likely, you're going to know the names. You'll have seen them in other people's bibliographies and references. You'll be familiar with their work. So if the Board of Editors includes a number of names that are completely unknown to you, beware. If the journal promises to launch a huge suite of products but doesn't have the resources to support them, not a good sign. Um, do be careful because here your work may never be published. <laughs> they may say, oh, we're going to put it in Journal X, but Journal X never even appears. So they've taken your money, your work's um, held by them because they have the copyright, and now you can't even get your work out there. So do be careful. And this is uh, related to it. If you see on their site that a number of journals um, in their suite read coming soon, <laughs> not a good sign. Uh, unless they have the resources to back that huge launch, uh, it's not going to happen. Um, so do be careful that your work actually does get out there. This may seem a little more obvious, but yeah, do check for the language on the website itself. The occasional typographical error is acceptable. We all make them. I imagine there are a few in these slides, in fact. Um, but if a journal claims to be the Journal of the American Society of Geophysics and there is broken English on the website, then that's not a good sign. Um, likewise, if there's a, a British society or a journal that purports to be part of a British society, but all the language on the website is American, 
Uh, there are no diphthongs in color versus color and so forth. Uh, that's not a good sign either. And that's something that most people probably wouldn't even catch unless they know the differences between British and American English. But those are warning signs. Do be careful. Basically, trust your gut. If it seems suspicious, do some research on them. Ask around. Ask your colleagues, definitely. If there's no contact information, this is um, definitely a warning sign because who will you contact about um, if you need to update the manuscript or if you need to um, uh, modify it in some way or if you want to try to submit it to a print journal, you know, any number of questions that can come up. If there's no contact information, obviously there's no means for you to get a hold of the people at the journal. And the last tip is the site's advertisers. So when you click on the site, you should see ads from other publishers, maybe author services, things related to the publishing industry, and things related to that particular uh, field. So going back to geophysics, I would expect to see something regarding geophysics. I don't know what in exactly, uh, perhaps some instrumentation, um, but if I go onto a site and I see a lot of rental car ads or ads for florists or just general ads that would be on any given site, I realize that this is a commercial endeavor and it's not about advancing science. If the journal has a false affiliation, beware. So if it claims to be the American Society of Geophysics and it's based in Indonesia, it's probably not a good sign. Um, probably a little more believable if uh, a former colony of Britain it declares itself to be the British Society of such and such. But again, do be careful. The nations should match the board of editors. It should match the scope of the journal. Some journals like to put international in the title to make them sound like they have a broader scope than they actually do. Um, and so unless the journal actually includes articles about the entire world uh, and from writers who come from the entire world, beware. Um, so something claims to be international and all of the authors happen to be from Honduras, you know, it's a good sign that this is actually a very limited regional journal. Nothing wrong with that. However, they should not have international in their title. And title and abstract errors. If your work's being misrepresent, misrepresented because there are errors in it, readers are less likely to go on to read your work. So errors in the title and in the, in the abstract are going to turn the reader off. The abstract's where you're selling your work. This is where you're convincing the reader that your conclusions are worth reading about, your methods are novel, or that your results are novel, your findings are something that your, your readers definitely need to keep on reading to understand. But if there are abstract errors on this journal site, who's going to want to read it? Um, they're going to assume that if the language isn't uh, appropriate, then perhaps the science is in, uh, as well. That's a false assumption, but you can understand why people would do that. And incorrect content. If the title of the journal and its scope don't match, beware. All this means is if you're submitting to an environmental engineering journal and you notice that the articles in this environmental engineering uh, journal include cancer research, archaeology, anthropology, and 18th century British literature, not a good sign. Because the readers of that journal aren't going to want to sort through all the irrelevant stuff to get to yours. Um, so your article is going to re remain buried. You're less likely to get cited. Um, you're less likely to have an impact. All right, I'm going to pause it here on authorship to uh, get to some of the questions that uh, have come up. Congress paper, Congress paper to a journal paper. Frederica, I'm 
Not a hundred percent sure about the Congress paper. Um, is this a, a legal document? Uh, something like an article of a constitution? Um, or a bill uh, that was passed into law? If so, I, I might have to get back to you after the session. <laughs> it's a good question. Oh, thank you, Nicola. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's a larger topic. And actually, Federico, I, I think that's something we need to jot down. Um, possibly for uh, an author resource center article. And you can hear my pen clicking. <laughs> and Teresa's jotting this down as well. So trust me, Frederica, your, your question will be addressed. Um, and what we can what we can do there is once we um, actually have create a, a resource for that is I was gonna say if Frederick Crow if you could um, email us I think at the email from which you received um, an invitation to the webinar then we can we can make sure that you get that back if, if you don't mind shooting us an email um, to that email address we can make sure that once we definitely have that resource that we're able to effectively answer your question. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, and Nicola and anyone else who's interested, please do just reply to that email, as Teresa was saying. Okay, thanks, Sally. <clears throat> Another question. Oh, Sally, excellent question. Yes, there are websites, numerous ones, in fact. Um, if you just do a web search for predatory journals, um, you will see both whitelists that include journals that are not predatory and blacklists of journals that are predatory. And I, I'm going to talk about this later in the uh, webinar, but there's a society with the acronym COPE, C-O-P-E. Do you remember the uh, expansion of that? Community. I actually got an email from this one. Um, it's maybe community committee of publication ethics. Okay, the committee of publication ethics. Um, they have a wonderful, essentially a white list, and what they do is they uh, they have author services and journals become members of their society, and they're regularly audited by the committee. The Committee on Publication Ethics. Thank you, Tiffany. And you all are on top of this. Okay, well, I don't see anyone typing furiously. Oh, forgive me. There we go. Sally, <laughs> Nicola has the link. <laughs> Good. Um, I think we can move on to the next topic largely because I don't want to hold you too long, uh, and we can always return to questions later. So, authorship. Now, I'm borrowing from Dr. Panter here, uh, who is one of the contributors to the Author Resource Center. Clearly conveying who is responsible for published work is integral to scientific integrity. So we need to know who the authors actually are. The International Committee of Medical Journal Arter Editors, the ICMJE, has a list of guidelines, and I'm just noting the top four that define what an author is. An author provides significant involvement in the study conception, design, data collection, or data analysis and interpretation, involvement in drafting or revising the manuscript, Approval, the final version of the manuscript for publication, and 
has responsibility for accuracy and integrity of all aspects of the research. And speaking to that last bit, some journals require a public guarantor for each article, or an author who takes responsibility for the entire project, including the conception, data acquisition and analysis, and the publication. So authors have a great deal of responsibility on them, especially that one <laughs> who's going to be the corresponding uh, author that the journal will uh, continue to pester with comments from peer reviewers and such. On a side note, the order of the author's names uh, may be listed alphabetically, but typically it's going to be by magnitude of contribution. So that, that one author who's responsible is going to be first. That's your lead author. Um, sometimes you'll have the, uh, the most senior scientist uh, not be the corresponding uh, author, and you can sort out whose name should go first. Now, issues that come up with, uh, with authorship. I'm going to talk about honorary authorship and ghost authorship. And with honorary authorship, there are three that I wanted to touch on. Uh, there's gift authorship, where the study is gifted to somebody who didn't actually contribute to it. So uh, if perhaps there was a, a lead scientist in your field who you admire very much, who contributed a great deal to your work and who inspired you, and who recently uh, was deceased, perhaps you want to honor that person. So you include that person as an author. It's actually not the place to do it. Uh, definitely list that person in acknowledgments. And you can write a very lengthy acknowledgment section if you wish. But by gifting authorship, you're now using that person's good name as part of your research. And your research may be uh, a breakthrough uh, discovery. It may be a, a huge contribution to the field. But if that scientist had nothing to do with it, that scientist's name should not be on it. And that's very much uh, like a guest author. Now, this is not something that's done in honor of someone else. This is just where someone's pulled into the list of authors because Generally, anything they submit will get published. So the authors of the study are trying to use this person's name to get published somewhere. And tied to that is coercive authorship. And I hope none of you have faced this before, but this is where a PI, a lab director, a dissertation director, uh, someone who has authority over you says, include this person as an author. <laughs> uh, it's unethical. And unless you feel secure in being able to report the unethical behavior, you may be stuck. Um, unfortunately, the journal to which you submit the work probably will not publish it, because hopefully they will catch that this author was not indeed an author. Um, so what I would recommend you do if someone tries to force you to add a name that doesn't belong to the study, to say, I'm worried about it getting published because of this wonderful topic that I saw on the Author Resource Center that Dr. Marbet gave, and he said that the chances of getting published are not very good if we include someone who actually didn't author the study. Um, yeah, by all means, use my uh, name as an authority, but yeah, don't mention me at all. Just, just note that there's a good chance you won't get published if you include this author's name. <laughs> yeah, Gaston, I love it. Yeah, the paper's a crime. <laughs> the author's responsible for that crime. Um, that's giving it a negative connotation, but I like the way you think. Uh, and Tatiana, Snowy, I want to get back to your uh, questions, but I'm, I'm just going to get through the slides. I want to get to these observations as well, so if need be, I'll scroll back. Um, problems with honorary membership. This can mask industry ties to a paper. So if a study funded uh, uh, was funded by a corporation, but there's no disclosure that that corporation actually uh, funded the study, that means the paper is assumed to be objective. It's an academic piece. It's not one that may have some sort of industry bias. And 
if you have an honorary um, author coming in from academia, it elevates the study and makes it appear as though, oh, this is coming out of this academy or that university, as opposed to coming from, I don't want to use an actual name, but coming from some large chemical company or from some large uh, solar power company. It can elevate the study beyond its potential impact, and I already touched on that. You're using someone else's good name to elevate the work. Um, the downside to that is your work may truly be breakthrough research that needs to be out there, and if the journal uh, publisher catches this, uh, then your work's not going to get out there, or it's going to take longer for it to get out there. And of course, there's that whole attributing without permission issue. Um, it really, you're stealing someone's identity. Uh, if you want to get down to it, honorary authorship is identity theft. Now, ghost authorship is the opposite. This is where a large amount of the manuscript has been generated by someone who isn't included in the list of authors. Again, <laughs> this might be related to the industry. Um, so, if a large pharmaceutical company has a team do the study and then um, someone else takes that work and publishes it under their name, the readers are going to assume it's by that person and not by the group in the pharmaceutical company. So essentially the pharmaceutical group are the ghosts and the person whose name that it was published didn't really do anything. <laughs> Um, aside submitted to a journal, I suppose. Sometimes this comes up when um, an author service will provide language content or provide um, data or interpret data for you or analyze data. Uh, this could be a ghost researcher or a ghost writer, but basically any content that's developed by somebody other than the people listed as the authors, that content was ghosted. Uh, it's haunting the paper. And I realize that this citation is a bit dated, um, but the numbers, I think, speak for themselves. Uh, such ghost authorship was present in approximately one-tenth of papers published in six medical journals in 2008. I cite the Whistler article at the end. Uh, so if you'd like to see that, I believe it's a BME uh, publication. And yes, it is a bit dated, but you can see the names of the six journals in which this occurred. And you can imagine that this is probably true for many of the journals out there. So it's not having somebody edit your language or formatting. It's not having someone go in and, re and revise and polish a little bit. That's completely different than generating content. So any content generated for the study, whether it's the language itself, the data collection, the analysis, whatever, that's ghost authorship. And for professional guidelines regarding authorship, I recommend seeing the Coalition for Responsible Publication Resources, the CRPR, the links um, what it is to, uh, to be an author. The author should disclose all their contributors and their specific individual contributions and affiliations. And the author should sign a formal declaration about their contributions. So basically this is a statement saying, you know, we are the ones who did author, we are the ones who created the content. And the author should publish a comprehensive list of contributors in a detailed acknowledgement section. So hopefully we can move on to the next topic um, after I address some questions. So let me see if I can this is
Looking down on my screen. No audio and slide. No, I would just I would exit. The meeting room. Yeah. Everybody can you hear us now? You can hear us now. Yeah, Tiffany's verifying sound. Great, thank too. you. Thank We're you so much. We're switching computers here real quick. Right there, right there, goes off the chair. That's good. Okay. Um, and what do I do to go down? Just, just. Okay, y'all. Um, so, how to define significant contribution? Basically, if you feel that that person's um, contribution advanced your study in any way, please do include that person. Not necessarily as an author. You may just need to cite them. Um, as a personal communication. So there could be a fine line there. I don't know what the percentage is for significant contribution, but if, I guess if you find that you've cited somebody 50 times in an eight-page document, that's a good sign that that person's actually an author because they've generated so much content for you. Um, you can always ask the journal uh, to which you're submitting to be sure, to say, you know, I'm not 100% sure whether I should include this person as an author or merely as a, a contributor by citing that person. That way you are covered. And that's the most important thing is to make sure that um, you're not going to run into uh, any issues. But there was an earlier question, and I'm on a different computer now, so pardon me as I slide up here and try to address it as well. Yeah, I'm going back to Snowy's uh, comment. I was an undergrad ethical reviewer. I encountered students being removed as an author because they failed the research subject, and student who passed the subject would be retained by the author. This is the protocol from one of the college heads. How do I deal with this? And Snowy, this is actually outside my wheelhouse. I forgive the metaphor. This is something that uh, I'm not familiar with. Um, it almost sounds more like an ethical board within the university, so I'm going to have to get back to you on that and see if I can um, steer you in the right direction within our resource center. And Nadia, in regards to um, PhD students in Algeria, must publish a paper before the final submission of the dissertation, including the supervisor as co-author. That's, that's a practice across many, many, many nations. <laughs> Um, and it's frustrating if the uh, supervisor didn't actually co-author, um, <clears throat> but that's widely accepted. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that in my program that wasn't the case. My director did make significant contributions, I feel, but none of it was in her voice. Um, it was always editorial comments, and um, she directed me towards research resources that I needed to include, but it wasn't as though she was telling me what methods to use and uh, what instruments to use and what. There are others that have been around longer than that. Uh, there are many who have only been around for a few years. And those that have only been around for a, full year, or a few years may be perfectly legitimate corporations. Don't, uh, don't shy away from new companies. We were once a startup too. Um, just do a little research on them. Be careful about the kind of help that they offer. Uh, they offer some help is inappropriate, and you may be able to identify unethical behavior before you've signed a service agreement with them. So before you even get involved with that company, here are some tips that might be able to help you. So appropriate author services will have clear ethical limits on what they will or will not provide. They will deny a client's request that crosses an ethical boundary. And they will not help a client plagiarize or commit other ethical violations. So the company shouldn't off offer to write content for you 
If they do, that's a problem. Um, if that's anywhere in the language on their site, don't go any further because you may have difficulty publishing your work because that company uh, may have been identified as a ghost author company. There is a blacklist of author services, and I think there are various um, governments that actually uh, list which author services should not be used by people within their research institutions. Ethical providers will not help you plagiarize or commit other ethical violations, and they won't help you fabricate or manipulate results or figures. And I've linked to an article by Dr. Mudrak uh, on that topic. And most importantly, they won't sell a client guest authorship. So they won't say, hey, we'll, we'll generate this content for you uh, and make your work sound better. No, your work can stand on its own. Uh, please do not go forward with an author service that tries to push these services on you. What they will do is improve a manuscript's form without changing the content. And they may be accredited by an outside agency or be a member of a society such as the Committee on Publication Ethics. And again, thank you all for the earlier links. Uh, you are all web savvy. <laughs> Love it. Um, language editing should entail clarifying the language without adding or subtracting information. So no content added. Formatting to consist of changing layout elements and references to conform to a journal's specifications, but again, not adding content. And review services should assess the content, statistics, and novelty without directly rewriting the manuscript. So those are just three types of services as I mentioned. There are many others out there. When you look into an author service, obviously you look for price, quality, and reputation, but look at the service level agreement. See what it actually says. If there's anything in that agreement that insinuates that they will write it for you, run away. <laughs> um, or you know, just ask them flat out, does this mean that you would write this section for me? I need help with my results. It doesn't hurt to ask a question like that because then you could find out whether or not they would offer um, ghost authorship. And definitely you want to research whether the service operates within academic and publishing ethics. How do you do that? Well, again, see what's in that service level agreement, ask them questions and see if they will help you generate content, or look on the web. Um, look to see what other customers have said about them, look to see if they are uh, blacklisted by anybody. Now that's the last bit on author services, and I thank you so much for dealing with the uh, technical issues earlier. Um, I have a couple other slides I just want to show you real quick, and then we can go to the questions if you all have any about author services, or if you want to come back to any of the earlier topics. So when you receive this uh, document, you'll see the hyperlinks here to plagiarism, self-plagiarism, and so forth. Each one of these is authored by uh, one of um, Research Square's employees. And the Author Resource Center at the arc.aje.com has a number of resources on things such as comma placement, all the way up to topics such as this one, uh, ethics within uh, the publication community. So we have a, a huge bank of um, PhDs and MAs and MSs uh, who have generated a great deal of content. And thanks to questions like uh, Frederico's earlier, we're always getting more uh, content uh, based upon our customers and upon our colleagues uh, from across the globe. So we very much appreciate that. Um, the last slide. It was just uh, me covering myself so that when I'm talking about plagiarism, I wanted to make sure I didn't plagiarize. Uh, <laughs> these are the non-AJE sources that I mentioned earlier. Um, the earlier article by Whistler and the WAME guidelines, uh, which I paraphrased. 
So turning to your uh, questions, and actually, Teresa, I don't have to stare at slides. Did I just do stop sharing to get back on the webcam? Yes. I'd just like to see, well, I'd like to see you all, but I'll let you see me. Just hit start sharing. Uh -huh. All right. Well, I think y'all can see me now. Um, and I apologize for this format. We're in a teeny little room. Um, so I'm actually used to having a much wider area in which to work. But I do appreciate your thanks. Um, I thank you very much for you taking the time to join us here at AJE. And I'm going to address some of the questions that came up. Let's see. Where can I find blacklists of author services companies? Sally, again, I would just do a web search. Um, just type in predatory author services or um, author services reputation. And if you come across one service that you question, um, by all means, look into them. We have a couple clones out there that have very similar names to American Journal Experts. I think there's to them um, and look them up just using uh, web searches. And getting back to Vinay's uh, question, I know third party, party providers that offer creation of a graphical abstract based on the data submitted. Is this an ethical practice? You know, Vinay, I don't know, so I'm going to take that question. It, yeah, I'm going to run that by our figures team. And yeah, that's a very good question. I don't want to give you the answer because you know, I, I'll confess my ignorance here. Uh, but we will get back to you. In fact, um, to facilitate that, Vinay, if you could just email the text that you wrote here, just copy and paste it into an email and reply to the link that was sent to you that invited you to this uh, webinar, we will definitely get back to you. Um, Nicola is asking about price discount for some number of manuscripts. I heard prices are very high. Yes, uh, Nicola. I think there may be um, discounts for large numbers. For and we do have a, a group program. Um, University. Sorry. <laughs> hey, this is Tracy. <laughs> we do have a groups program for um, for labs and universities, um, and we do have um, different. Uh, I was going to say, I think a discount for that. So um, again, if you guys have any any questions like that, I would be more than happy to make sure that we get answers to you. And so, um, if you'll just when you reply back to that link, it actually comes back to me, and that way I can facilitate and coordinate with the right people internally to make sure. That your question and the answer taken care of. That's a great question. Thank you. Didn't realize you'd be on screen today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, I'll stick around and see whether there are a few other questions. We have plenty of time. I'm not just going to uh, wrap this up for the sake of wrapping it up. Um, but if you've already had your questions answered and you're just waiting for the slides, you know, feel free to log off. And thank you for your time. Uh, how do we get the slides in the replay? <laughs>